So I, I never set out to get into business. That was literally never my aim. I, I wanted to be a pilot when I was a kid, like an airline pilot. And um, it was just a very, very expensive career path and not one that was financially open to us. So I basically started doing you know, web websites and bits of graphic design work on the side to pay for flying lessons. And that turned into a business. And this, so I was 14, right? And then by the time I was 16, we now had you know, TE staff in New York, Manchester, London, and Sydney. And it just, it just sp sparked this whole new journey that I just never expected to have. And one of the things I'm really grateful for is at that age, you've got that naivety just to kind of explore and just to follow threads and see where they lead. And I find that even today is probably the most interesting things that happen career-wise and in life come from just following those threads now and again. So no, it was never the intention to become a business person. You know, I would have, I would have been quite happy flying people around. So there was a degree of organic at the beginning, right? And it's interesting because no, no one cares until you're big enough to care about. And at the time where we started, there, was not, there wasn't many people in our sector. And I remember getting a phone call from you know, somebody who was a competitor and they said, oh, we, we need to see you. We'd love to see you. And I was like, I thought I was in trouble. I was a kid. And as it turned out, it was these two guys who ran a much big, you know, slightly, somewhat bigger agency than ours. And um, they just said, you know, we love what you're doing. We love the fact that, you know, you're like a kid doing this. And they said, can we mentor you? And I didn't, I didn't know what mentorship meant. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know, you know, what does it mean to be a mentor or a mentee? But what they did was almost give me a bit of rocket fuel by teaching me what they did wrong. And the fact that I could re lean on them when I had a, a decision to make or I was unsure about something. So having that base of experience there in these, in these two people that kind of became mentors, like that, that, was, that was really amazing. And it taught me the power of mentorship. And then as the company continued to grow, you know, there was individuals like that who were you know, very experienced in their fields, not always in business, I might add, but very experienced in their fields who just became counsel. Because when you're creating something, there's no textbook, there's no playbook, there's no manual that says, here's what you do next. So you need such a good support structure around you to do that. I think cultural leadership is really important. So, you know, my, my family came from, 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 from India originally and entrepreneurship's in the blood, you know, so Indian and Pakistani communities, it's just, it's just part of what they do that, you know, it's not some weird, cool thing to be an entrepreneur. It's almost weird if you're not. It's just part of life. So, so there's that demystification of business, which I think really helps you when you get started because it makes you realize it's not that hard. You've just got to do it well. Um, and then in terms of the cultural approach to leadership, my, um, my first business, we had a lot of clients and activity in the US. And so I used to spend a lot of time in the States. And I was always really fascinated by the leadership approach there because it was much more open. It was much more emotional. It was much more holistic. And I really resonated with that versus the style of leadership that we saw a lot in Europe and the UK, which was a bit more of a hangover from the industrial area. You know, like, you're my employee. I will tell you what to do. It, it's not healthy. So, so I really resonated with the much more kind of emotionally intelligent style of leadership that was coming over from the US and spent a lot more time honing those skills. Um, but I think the cultural component is critical and you have to be able to adapt that now as well based on where you're doing business, how you're doing business and what, what industry you're in. I mean, there's two things, right? The, f the first of all is you, you've got to be clear what you want, right? And, and you've got to be really razor honest about it. So you now I teach on a couple of MBA programs and I always say to the students, look, you know, if you want to be rich, don't get into entre entrepreneurship, go and work for McKinsey or Goldman Sachs. You'll make tons of money. You'll be happy. If that's your objective, that's fine. Go do that. Because if, if what you do 
is is misaligned with your own value set and your own objective. You, you're just never going to be able to put in the effort to succeed because it's hard. The second part is focus. Um, when, when I was starting out in businesses, we didn't have weirdly the same level of distraction. So now when I'm working with startups and scale-ups in particular, the, there's this tendency that going to a networking event is a substitute for work or doing a webinar is a substitute for work or keeping your social media profile up to date is a substitute for work. It isn't. Your business is nothing if you haven't got a product or a service that works. And so there's a degree of focus needed. And I would always counsel people that, you know, there's plenty of time in your career for the sizzle and the fun bits and all that. But if you want to succeed, you need to be, A, you've got to want to do it for a start. Sounds a bit noddy, but it's not. You've got to really want to do it. But then you've got to be razor focused and you've got to make that thing your everything until you get it sustainable. I think that there definitely is. Um, and I think this is something which we really have to get over. And, and one of the one of the key key areas you see this is in funding, right? Because most people who come into venture capital and private equity cut their teeth in investment banking or consulting. Both of those environments have this very toxic, very hyper alpha masculine culture. And it's it's not good for anybody, never men or women, right? But that culture then becomes a hangover into the other really essential funding pools, such as private equity and venture capital. And so you do see that. They're very aggressive. They're not welcoming. So, so you, you see it in, in that regard. But you also, I think, see it where there's a tendency to create silos. And you saw this in the early days with um, cross-cultural leadership. So you found a lot of the Indians just went to Indian business networking events and things like this. Whereas the, you know, the, the real important bit is to actually get people to interact and meet and realize that there are no differences and there is no issue with dealing with another culture or another gender. You know, it's, it's one of those things where our cognitive biases sometimes don't allow us to do that. I think the other side is trying to speak about it differently. So I'll give you, give you an example. One of the first media interviews I did when I was a kid, basically still, they asked me, you know, so how does it feel to be, you know, a successful Asian entrepreneur? And I was like, well, I guess like any other entrepreneur, but Brown, I, I don't know, like, what, what do you want me to say? And, and this is what I see all the time now, where someone gets asked the question, how does it feel to be a successful female entrepreneur? And in the same way that somebody asked me, how does it feel to be a successful Asian entrepreneur? What they're really asking is, how come you're successful in spite of the fact that you are female, Asian, black, disabled, whatever that descriptor is. So if we're going to make progress, we have to remove the descriptor. It's how did you succeed as an entrepreneur? You know, that, that is the question. So I think we've still got a long way to go on that, unfortunately. There's a layer of support that has to be built in, but then there's also how national and global press report. And, I'm, and I think the support network's critical, and I think they're the adjectives critical because you need to know who to go to for support. But I'm sick and tired of the adjectives being used at the top level in national press because I think sometimes that's, that's unhealthy. Um, so when I, when I started, again, whilst it wasn't gender, there was definitely racism in the UK in the, in the kind of 80s. And... As, as, as an entrepreneur of color, um, you had to try double hard. You had to try really, really extra hard to prove that you deserved a seat at the table. And I didn't like having to do it because it makes you feel weaker sometimes having to do it because you're like, well, why do I have to try double hard? Why don't they? But if you're going to break into the system, you have to. And actually, the more people that do, the more people get a seat at the table and the more change happens. So if I look, look at the example, for example, uh, of, of, of people of Indi from Indian and Pakistani origin, in the 1980s, there was no representation really in senior roles in, in, in anywhere. But now fast forward 20 years and a bit, you know, we've got Rishi Sunak. We've got so many, you know, corporate leaders who are of, of, of Indian and Pakistani descent. And it's because 
they had to work extra hard to get a seat at the table. And then when they were at the table, they could put the ladder down and make sure that the people behind them could get their own merit and not have to compete double hard for that same role. So I think for the pioneers, and unfortunately, I think women have to be pioneers still in many ways. It's that, it's, it's do whatever you can to get a seat at the table. I, I, t I tell you, it's, it's probably the single most common challenge that's faced by startups. And the answer is, valid the answer is validation. And, and, what, and that, that means many broad things. But first of all, you know, the real thought experiment that's unfortunate that people have to go through is just because you care doesn't mean anybody else does, right? There's plenty of people that have what appears to be a very good idea, but there just isn't a market or no one else cares. You know, we looked at investing in a company that could um, give oil rig operators an additional 100 million pounds of revenue over the lifetime of the rig. They didn't care. It wasn't enough of a saving for them to be bothered. Go figure, right? So, so someone has to care enough for it to be real. And the second thing is that you've got to start having conversations early, right? You've got to speak to potential customers, potential partners, you know, potential collaborators, because you've got to try and understand, is there enough momentum out there where this can turn from an idea through to being a prototype and actually something that scales out well? Um, the, the final point on that is you've got to then determine what does scale mean for your idea, right? My view is it is quite acceptable for someone to build a business which becomes a lifestyle business for them or a great small business. That's great. But if you want your business to turn into, you know, a hyperscale business that's in the billions of revenue, that's got to be extraordinary. That has to be rare. That has to be something that, that is those, you know, one in a million level of genius ideas to get to that point. So you've got to manage your own expectations as well and be realistic about the idea. But the first step is to get out there and validate. That's, that's the most important thing. So, so the most important bit of advice is in the, in, in the early days, don't rush, right? Because... It's, it's a really common problem I see where you end up with a group of co-founders who just don't get on. And it's because they, they, they failed at the first rule of building a team, which is you recruit for culture first, right? Because whatever you do, there will be plenty of people out there with the skills, right? The skills are not the issue. What breaks founding teams is there isn't a cultural alignment. And so what that means is you have to take your time with recruitment. You have to understand what the cultures and values are that you want your business to have. And you have to try and codify them somehow so you can communicate them. You know, what does success mean? How are you going to make decisions? What is your value set, right? So, so in the early days, you have to recruit for culture. As your business scales, it's not quite that simple because you know, you might onboard some venture capital money and it might be that you now need 500 developers like now. And what that means is that you codify culture well and you don't necessarily recruit for culture, but you do try and create programs that adapt individuals into your culture and induct them into it really, really well. So that culture piece is critical. And in terms of how you find them, it sort of comes back to what we did before, what we said before around validation. It's attend the kind of spaces that your tribe hang out. You, you've got to get into their space to connect with them. You know, it might be that you go to some geeky meetups. Like when we were recruiting in that first business, um, a lot of people involved in video games at the time were extraordinarily capable coders and they could code extremely efficiently. And when I wanted to hire developers, I went to what were called LAN parties, video game parties at universities, not to play games, but just to meet people and say, hey, you're really cool. Do you, do you want to come and work for me? And that was far more effective because you're, you're just getting to know people. And in the early days, you've got the time and the privilege to be able to do that because, you know, when your company scales and you need to recruit hundreds or thousands of people, you simply cannot get into that level of detail with it.
So if we if we continue with the thread of, of, of a business being your baby, you know, if you coddle your baby too much, it will grow up to hate you. You know, it's 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 literally that simple. Where as an entrepreneur, you've got, you've got to realize that you, you have to introspect enough to know what to let go of, what you're good at, what you're bad at, and realize if you want your company to grow, you've got to let go of that. Now, if you are just genuinely not capable of doing that and it genuinely pains you too much to do it, maybe you shouldn't be a business owner, right? I think it's really that simple because if you want any business to succeed, you've got to A, make yourself a little bit redundant um, because it's got to pass what I lovingly call the London bus test, which is if I cross the road tomorrow and get hit by a bus, nothing should change at the office tomorrow at all, right? It's got to be that resilient. And that comes by having a brilliant team who are delegated to and who are empowered with that delegation to get on with it. A lot of entrepreneurs mistake delegation for ordering, right? And what I mean is, it's all well and good me saying to someone, go do this, but I need to empower them to actually do it. They shouldn't have to then check with me, right? So delegation has to be pretty absolute for it to work well. And that means you also need to let people make mistakes. You need to let them grow. You need to, you know, it's, it's really, really hard. But this is where for me, as a, as a business owner, my mentors are really important because they've been on that journey. They know how it feels and they can say to me, well, you know what? That is hard, but, but you need to do it. And, and it coaxes you into it. But, you know, there probably is a subset of people who just don't want to, but I, I, would, I would really honestly say to them, maybe it isn't the right career choice. I think if I was redesigning a, a program from day one, I would weirdly change the syllabus. So I would remove quite a bit and I would add in things like philosophy and psychology and anthropology because business has changed. We're no longer kind of the widget era. We're no longer kind of you know, making things per se. We're in the era of knowledge-based businesses where it's software, it's SaaS, it's hard. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole different way of being. And what that means is as a business leader, you're not running a machine, you're running people. And if you want to understand people, you have to understand their philosophy, their ideology, their psychology, their motivation. And these are bits which are unfortunately quite absent from a lot of business programs. And the philosophy bit is really important because, you know, a, a lot of businesses now are global from the start. So what that means is that, you know, let's say, Nadja, you might start a business making this thing, whatever this thing might be. That business might have its first customers in Japan, not even domestically. And you've got two options. Either you understand philosophy, in which case when you go to Japan, you understand the depth of their you know, levels of respect and approach. And so you naturally you know, become part of the culture. Or you don't. And you read a book about what does cross-cultural communication look like. And it's very wooden and you never make a real human connection. So philosophy is one of the weirdly most important things that I've seen in business. And on the journey of meeting lots of business people, you know, with thought economics and other projects, it's amazing how many really successful business people's bookshelves are not filled with business books, but they're filled with history and science and politics and all those other subjects, because that's what helps you connect the dots in your brain. Mm -hmm.